Hi everyone, it's Andrew with The Market Mindset. Today we're catching up with a reaction video. Always my favorite, Patrick Bet David. I love uh, watching his show. I love his take on things. And he is talking about nuclear energy. Now his uh, video is 20 minutes long, why the oil industry hates and fears it. Uh, we won't do the whole 20 minutes. Uh, it, I'm sure it'll be enlightening, but we're gonna pick up bits and pieces. As everyone knows, I'm all for nuclear. I also don't have a, a huge problem with oil and gas. We're going to need it for the transition. But let's get into his take. So a little secret the oil industry has been trying to keep away from you, but we're going to try to expose it here today. This is a dangerous video. You'll see why. Let me tell you why. Because the oil and gas industry is a $7 trillion industry. There's so many people that have their hands in them making money. They're like, guys, we can't tell everybody that there's another way. That Finland just did something. They save power and energy for their consumers by 75%. We can't have the rest of the world to know about this. Because what if all of a sudden this goes from a $7 trillion industry to $1.8 trillion? dollars we cannot do that in that industry the source they're worried about is nuclear energy nuclear plants so what they do is they hire lobbyists 124 million dollars in 2022 and nuclear only spend 1.56 million dollars so they got a lot of powerful people protecting them and they'll come out and say things like this nuclear plant what do you think about when you think about the world word nuclear explosion so th this is great. Uh, I mean, he's giving it that flavor and, and the reality of the drama. Uh, if you're interested, look at Michael Schellenberger. He covers this very well in regards to how uh, it's been shown a lot of oil and gas companies have funded NGOs and uh, eco environmentalist groups on their behalf uh, to, you know, to to challenge nuclear uh, in any way. And, you know, it's, it might seem weird to you that, well, if it's the safest and cleanest and it's the greenest, which it is by all science evidence based <laughs> approaches, why aren't we doing more of it? Uh, because there is a strategic campaign against it. Uh, and it isn't necessarily just oil and gas, although it would have its, its hand in it for sure. Uh, that's a lot of money at stake. It, it truly is. Uh, but it is environmentalist as well. Uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of NIMBY, not in my backyard. People don't feel comfortable with it. Even if it's safe and clean, uh, there's still concerns about uh, just overall maintenance and care of having something like that in your backyard. So, and justifiable. Uh, but what we need more is a uh, strategic campaign uh, from top down, not only from the industry itself and sector, but from government explaining to people that it is safe uh, and that we've come a long way since any of these uh, standalone issues. I had a chance to speak with John Highway, uh, who is with Stormcrow Capital. He is a real industry leader. He's been on every lithium board I can think of in panel, but he's also got in-depth knowledge of the uranium space and nuclear space. And we have a series called Critical Thinking in which he goes into detail about uh, the advantages of nuclear and where we're at. And as COP28 has just started, uh, we've noticed that the U.S. has, you know, really stamped its claim that it's going to be a major, major powerhouse in this area. Uh, now let's get into some more of the meat before I get into all the details. Radiation. This is horrible. This is why what happened to Fukushima and Chernobyl. This is why we have to protect the people. But then if you think about the oil industry, if it does get disrupted, what region of the world would get plummeted? the Middle East, it's not as if it is already chaotic. Saudi Arabia relies on oil. You take that out, would the Middle East get even more chaotic? Would some of the powerful people in US that are in the oil industry get more chaotic? That's pretty scary. So they obviously have more leverage, but let me tell you what just happened in Finland. The newest nuclear reactor in Europe and the biggest by capacity started producing electricity in Finland earlier this year. Orki Luoto 3, which has completed test production and is now regularly producing electricity. Uh, he's got a good point. Uh, Saudi Arabia, Aramco, they've actually are finishing up building. They're midway through building a, a massive vanadium redux battery. Uh, so it is a renewable uh, approach. They're very cognizant of this shift uh, and they're going about it a different way. They're not uh, necessarily going nuclear, <laughs> uh, but we see China certainly has. Uh, if they could go, uh, they would uh, ramp up even further productions. They have 150 reactors on scale that they're planning for. That's, that's a lot to put things in perspective. I believe the US currently has 98 functioning right now. Uh, China is leading the way as far as nuclear goes. Their issue is they can't get supply uh, from from Kazakhstan and in fact, Canada. Uh, so if they could get free rule of uranium, uh, they would be building out nuclear at a pace that would be shocking. So for all those people who don't like the talk of green and, and climate change and all these other political kind of discussions, just look at this as a, an energy discussion. That's it. 
as sectors that are competing because if you allow China to gain control and totally monopolize nuclear or renewables, what does that look like? What does that mean? So even if you're not a big fan and you are a huge oil and gas fan, uh, you don't want them having a stranglehold. Anyways, let's, let's move on. For 30% of Finland's power generation, the plant operator TVO says, after the startup of Oki Luoto 3, power prices in Finland, ready, saw a 75% plunge between December 2022 and April of 2023. It's expected to produce electricity for the next 60 years. Given period of time, a plant with a capacity factor of 100% means it's producing power all the time. What plant do you think has the highest capacity factor? I'm assuming you took the guess and it's the right guess. Ready? Take a look at this. Nuclear, number one, 92.7%. Then it's geothermal. Then it's natural gas. Then it's other gas. Then it's other biomass. Then it's wood, coal, hydro. Let's pause here. Uh, and this is important because there's a difference between uh, you know, battery and renewables when you hear about uh, solar and uh, offshore wind and intermittency, which is the biggest problem there. When you're talking about base load power, so the grid, like what you need as just your basic foundation of power, nuclear is by far the most important one and moving forward, most important. That's not taking anything away from geothermal because if you live in a region that you can do geothermal, then yes, by all means, do it. If you live in a place that uh, you've got hydro, that you can build a dam, that also is fantastic. I mean, look at Niagara Falls. Uh, so we have to kind of use different techniques and different uh, you know, applications and tools that we have in different regions. Uh, obviously, you know, you know, we, in places that get a lot of you know, great, like say Ireland or where I live, Vancouver, solar panels aren't the, the greatest approach. Um, you know, whereas you get something in the desert, sure, solar panels. Uh, same thing as, as we've got a, a site C dam here that uh, has been providing clean energy for BC, but we would need uh, about, I think one engineer said about nine more of those to meet the capacity of 2030 if we all went electric just for cars. So, you know, this is where we need to look realistically and say, that's not going to happen. Uh, where, where should we look? So nuclear is definitely on the table. Uh, but gas still is. It's the cheapest and, and cleanest, most affordable. Um, and uh, that's where this gets a bit more dynamic and, and, and uh, political. Because if we just got a lot of the third world countries and China, say, and Germany off of coal uh, and just had them using liquid natural gas, then, you know, if you were concerned about emissions, they would drop dramatically. So much so that anything the candidate would do, if we just stopped all industry, it would be meaningless. It would have that much more of an impact. Anyways, let's let's go on. This in 2021 under Biden, $480 billion of stimulus spending was available for clean energy, of which only $8.8 billion went towards nuclear energy. Some of you may be watching and saying, Pat, I'm not trying to get into the nuclear business. Why are we doing this video? Do you want to get into the saving business? Because this could be applying to you. Your, your family may be interested in this. Your mom, your, your dad, your wife, your husband, people may be interested in this. Take a look at this. Household electricity prices worldwide in September of 2022. This is last year. Denmark is the highest. You think people in Denmark want that to be lower? How about Italy? How about Germany? How about Belgium? How about Lithuania? How about Netherlands? So there's some mixed messages here. Um, we hear you know, that the Biden administration is open to nuclear and they're doing all this green initiative, yet that's a very small number, 8.8 .8 billion out of 480 towards nuclear. Um, that brings up a lot of questions. Uh, how serious are you about this issue? How serious are you about transitioning? Um, and also, I mean, it's, it's a lot to know. There's a lot to know. Uh, and also building a nuclear reactor isn't the easiest thing we've seen now with the small modular reactors with new scale. Uh, they ran into huge cost uh, problems. Uh, these small modular reactors have to buy all of their uranium up front. So they have to get all the fuel, it starts up and then it runs, r runs by itself. That's a big cost. Uh, and if you're in the, in the middle of trying to build one out, um, especially during massive inflation, good luck. Uh, and these are huge endeavors. Uh, and the small modular one went out of, out of, uh, uh, you know, cost base because of inflation. Imagine building a giant reactor. Uh, but once again, we're, we're dealing with a bit of a mixed message here because once we go all electric and say they make uh, natural gas uh, off the, the, the charts or, or off the table, let me assure you the cost of electricity is going to go through the roof. They're not going to make it cheap and affordable for everyone. Uh, so when you become the only game in town, 
there's going to be there's going to be some issues and that has obviously people concerned let's let's move on we've done that we got five objections for you the arguments against nuclear energy first one is nuclear waste second one is accidents third one is security fourth one is cost and last one is sustainability let's start off with nuclear waste nuclear power plants produce radioactive waste which can be dangerous to human health and the environment. The counter to that is used nuclear fuel rods are stored safely and securely at reactor and storage sites around the country, either in enclosed. I'll stop here. Uh, that's great. And that is a major win. I mean, it's true. They are stored safely. Uh, that does get a bit of a counter from people because they don't feel that comfortable. Uh, if you go to our series, uh, Critical Thinking with Rabbi Moskovitz, you'll see that Curio is actually, who's won an award with the US government, uh, can recycle nuclear waste. So they are working right now uh, you know, through Synergist Holdings uh, with Curio to, to make this technology come to scale. That is a huge game changer. Once, once you solve that issue of what are you doing with the waste? Well, we can we use it uh, in a reactor and get energy further out of it. Uh, that opens up the world of nuclear even further because the, these uh, arguments against quickly dissipate very rapidly. And we won't go into all five, uh, because they're easily explained as well. Um, but I want to just touch on that one because it is at the end of the day, next to cost is the main one you're going to hear out of anyone. So we'll skip along and, and get further along in the video. Once uranium reserves are depleted, nuclear power will no longer be a viable options. That's what the argument is. The counter, a typical 1000 megawatt nuclear facility in the US needs a little more than one square mile to operate. NEI says wind farms require 360 times more land area to produce the same amount of electricity and solar photovoltaic plants require 75 times more space. To put in perspective, you would need more than 3 million solar plants to produce the same amount of power as a typical commercial reactor or more than 430 wind turbines. Yeah, and just imagine the amount of materials that is. So if you don't like mining, and as we know, mining is the key to all of this, uh, so you might might not be drilling one way, but you're drilling another way if you want this green future. Uh, in order to make the amount of silver and uh, graphite and uh, silicon, you name it, uh, all the materials to make a turbine, as well as any solar panel, it's in, it's enormous. So this saves a bit that way as well. So the U.S. Department of Energy made this uh, chart, which is actually pretty good. It says, how much power does a nuclear reactor produce? The equivalent of 3.125 million PV panels, solar panels, or 431 utility scale wind turbines, or 100 million LED bulbs, or roughly 1.3 million horses, or 2,000 Corvette Z06s. You want more perspective? Take a look at this one here. That one uranium pellet you're looking at, that looks like a female hand that that one lady is holding, an inch tall, is the same as 17,000 cubic feet of natural gas, 120 gallons of oil, and a ton of coal. And, and I want to really thank Patrick but David for doing this because it, it's very accurate. Uh, and someone who is, uh, loves this space, who loves uh, mining and what it can do. Uh, you know, we're being in Canada, we can be an amazing partner for the US. Uh, we have incredible assets here in uranium in the Athabasca Basin. Uh, and we cover a lot of uranium companies. We've we've talked about on different shows, Cameco, who's actually partnered in buying Westinghouse to actually kind of control that vertical integration. Uh, Cameco, a uranium producer, is now into building out small modular reactors and uh, as well as uh, their E. Vinci uh, Westinghouse uh, reactors. So we're going to see that space develop uh, in a big way. And I'd mentioned before, the U.S. had announced they're going to become a major player in nuclear. And once again, this doesn't have to be a political argument uh, in the sense of climate change. It could be a political argument in the sense that one of your main competitors and also your partners, uh, China, is developing nuclear at a pace that is startling and staggering. You don't want them to get ahead of you on, on renewables because uh, if you threaten them with choking them off with supply of uranium, believe me, they're going to choke off your supply to all the other critical metals that you don't have. So. This is, a, 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 I'm glad that he brought it up. Uh, it's so impressive that he, he wanted to even talk about this because there's so much misinformation about nuclear. Uh, and I think the more comfortable we get with it, it is the future. It should have been the future back in the 80s. Uh, and you know I can speak about it forever. Check out our channel as, as we do lots of talks about nuclear and uranium. But once again, thanks to Patrick, Beth, David and Valuetainment for even touching on this. <laughs>